We're jumping right into the weeds on this one. New World Screw Worm. We've talked a lot about it in the news. What is it? What does it mean? What could it mean for the U.S. cattle industry? We bring in Dr. Harold Newcomb, a technical services veterinarian with Merck Animal Health on this one. Hey, Doc, it's good to have you back on the program. Kind of just recapping here on this deal. The actual date was November 22nd uh, last year, 2024, when a new world screw worm uh, was detected near Mexico's southern border. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit about this, about what new world screw worm actually is and kind of what the threat is. I know that it does pose a significant risk to cattle health, but what exactly is is the new world screw worm? What is that? Well, the new worm, the new world screw worm is actually just a fly larva. Okay, I mean it, it's 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 the pupae, are basically what we, you and I would call the maggot. Okay, uh, the difference in this deal is with the new world screw worm, it likes living flesh. Where most of the time, when you see uh, an infestation of, of maggots, it's going to be on dead or dying tissue. The new world screw worm can actually. It, it actually likes fresh living tissue, and those flies will lay their eggs like on newborn calves on the navel, but they can also lay it into the mucous membranes, uh, like around the nose or the face, the eye. And so you can get screw worm in the eye, nose, any, any place that has exposed mucous membranes, you, you can get a uh, screw worm infestation, okay? Uh, the deal with this is once that, the egg is laid there and then it pupates or, or, or hatches and becomes a, a larva or maggot, then it's going to stay in that animal for about five to seven days and then it will come back out. But, it, but if you disturb it, it just steadily bores deeper and deeper. And sometimes uh, you can actually get death from these things. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a major, it's a major issue. And if you start looking at the economic impact, in places that have it, it's in the billions of dollars. Uh, and, and that's what we'd be afraid of in this country would be the economic impact of this thing. Uh, there's several chemicals out there that, that will kill it, but you got to eradicate the fly. And what the government has done, uh, they've cooperated with Mexico and several of the other South American countries, and in particular Panama, and they've set up a barrier zone. And what they've done is they've taken, they irradiate these uh these screw worm flies and they turn them out to make them sterile and they're sterilizing the males. The males breed with the females, but the eggs don't hatch. And that's the way they've controlled this. So we have talked uh, several times uh, about flies, about fly control, uh, about identifying different flies. And so is this an actual screw worm fly or is this something from your stable fly, your horn fly? No, no, uh, no. This is actually a screw worm fly. It is a screw worm fly. Okay. And that is something that is native to Mexico and some of those other Southern countries. Is that correct? Yes, sir. It's an, it's endemic down, down in South America. And then it's also, uh, you have it over in the Caribbean as well. And when you they, know, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I mean, you know, we had a little outbreak of screw worm. Uh, I think it was back in 2016 down in Florida, in the Florida Keys. And it took them about a year to get those things, to get it eradicated down there. And they did that with the sterilization deal of the flies and releasing those flies. So um, this screw worm fly, I'm assuming that there's kind of a line maybe in the United States where it, uh, it it wouldn't go past per se, just based on winter type climate. Is that correct? That it, that it tends to, it, it likes the warmer, more humid climate, even though a lot of people, everybody in the South is getting snow as we speak and it's cold. But uh, is that, is that correct? That that is the, the, the climate, the habitat of the screw worm fly? Well, yeah, I, I would say so. But what you have to understand, though, is that the way animals move, you could have it in Texas and you can have it in North Dakota the next day. Right. Yeah, true. True that. Okay. And and then the other thing that I think people need to understand, it's not just restricting the movement of the cattle that's going to that's going to help this deal. But, but what are you going to do with the livestock? I mean, not the livestock, but the wildlife. 
Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I didn't even consider that one, Doc. Yeah. I mean, think about think about how many wild mammals come across that, that river down there, undetected and, and uninspected. So of what we have right now for insecticides, for pesticides, for fly control, uh, and you and I have talked a lot about them. We've talked the various different ones. We've talked everything about ear tags and changing your chemistry and if you're going from pyrethroids to a different kind of tag and all of these different things and you and i have talked about that over the years of different strategies so if this would happen to show up in the united states do we have the chemistry available right now to be able to attack it uh, well, so we have some of them. Yeah. I mean, the, the chemicals that work like on horn flies and this type of thing should work on screw worms. Okay. But the trouble is that screw worm is going, that, that larva is going to be in the animal. So how you can get it out of the animal? Well, right now, the, the, the biggest thing that they could use would be ivermectin. Mm -hmm. But I mean, once you get the screw worm in the animal, it, it's kind of like the, 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 the ship has left the dock, right? I mean, prevention is what you want to do. And uh, if you look, if you look back through history uh, of, of the screw worm in the United States, I mean, we had it, but it was eradicated, I think, back in 1966. And the way they eradicated the thing was basically just through this, this, this irradiation of the male flies, the sterilization of the sterile uh, of the fly, male flies. And then they, they would turn those things loose into the environment and and that's the way you're going to eradicate it and there is a buffer zone down there in panama that was breached and that's the way it got into mexico but they do a buffer zone down there where they release these flies on on a on a uh, continual type basis and that's what keeps them down south we're going to take a quick break when we come back more on the new world screw worm with dr harold newcomb with merck animal health keep it locked to the ranch it up radio show welcome back to the ranch it up radio show the most information packed into a 30 minute program that you can find it's your all things ranching newscast and so glad to be hanging out with y'all questions comments concerns criticisms rants it doesn't matter give us a call at 707 ranch 20 you can text us there as well 707 ranch 20 that's 707 726 2420 email is ranch it up show at gmail.com prowling around social media at ranch it up show New World Screw Worm. We're talking with Dr. Harold Newcomb, a technical services veterinarian with Merck Animal Health. So here we are in January, and uh, the last thing on everybody's mind is flies, right? I mean, it really is as producers. I mean, that's the last thing that we're thinking about. But in light of what's going on, and we've shared multiple reports when they come out about New World Screw Worm, and uh, even how... Uh, Mexican uh, feeder cattle starting to uh, slowly come back into the United States with something like this of what you're telling me, there are red flags going up everywhere right now in my office. So really producers, even now, I mean, before those little baby calves are even on the ground for a lot of guys, uh, we need to start to be thinking about some fly control and prevention because that's the thing that you and i have talked about many times i mean by the time you got a pile of flies your problem is already there we have to think about prevention so let's talk strategies a little bit of going into the spring of really people understanding that you know this was a problem in mexico and what you're telling us this is a nasty little bugger so how can we prevent uh, something like this happening and inadvertently we're going to, we're going to be helping ourselves anyway, in terms of fly control. Well, I, I think on this one, this is a little bit different deal. Okay. Uh, because it's not really going to be something you can do to prevent. Okay. This is going to be making sure that the animals coming in imported have been properly checked and vetted. Okay. Uh, and, and like I said, if we have a problem with it, it's probably going to come in through the wildlife. I mean, think that down there on that Mexican border uh, with Texas, the Nia guy, right? So, I, I mean, the, the best thing that I would know to tell someone 
would be one to keep good close check on their animals. Okay, of course, to do that. You know, if we're looking at fly control for like horn flies and that type of thing, you know, that that's a different deal. There, there's different things that we can feed to get ahead of the head of the uh, head of the fly larva or the fly infestation to keep them down. But this one, this is going to be a little bit different deal. So this one has uh, definitely gotten on the radar of the USDA in many, many, many different ways is what, is, is what you're telling me. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They have spent millions, if not billions of dollars trying to eradicate this thing. I mean, if it got loose in the United States, you would see areas quarantined. Oh, wow. You would have, it would just basically stop commerce as far as livestock goes. Wow. Okay? Uh, like it, it, say, say it happened in, in, in the state of, uh, of Mississippi, Alabama, one of the southeastern states, you would probably see that state and every state that borders it have to be uh, livestock uh, movement restrictions. OK. And, and then there would be things in place that where they were checked, they would have to wait so long before they could move. They might have to be treated. Uh, they would be treated with something probably like an ivermectin type compound. There, there's several other insecticides that will work, but I mean, that's basically what we'd be looking at. I mean, it w- it would disrupt commerce tremendously. So, if you think about how many how many how many stalker calves or feeder calves come out of the southeast every day, right, right, feedlots, right, right. So not not trying to scare anybody, not trying to create a doomsday scenario or anything like that, but just for people to be aware, because this has been hitting the news here ever since, like I said, November 22nd. It's uh, There's been updates every few weeks on what's going on, just like the most recent update where... Um, you know, there's going to be start starting to move some of these uh, Mexican feeder cattle uh, into the United States. So um, I think the takeaway, if I'm understanding right, Doc, is that, that we just need to be vigilant of monitoring our livestock, be, paying very, very atten- uh, a lot of attention to situational awareness is what I call it. Uh, those little subtle changes in livestock and uh, to, to even... Monitor your wildlife or what's around the place. If you see anything that just just isn't quite right, uh, in my kind of understanding that that's maybe the best thing to do is just keep your eyes open. And if there is anything that is of any question, get a hold of your local veterinarian immediately. Yeah. In other words, if you start seeing wounds on cattle that don't make sense, or you see graining wounds on on like deer or other wildlife that that doesn't make sense that that you don't understand then you probably ought to contact somebody especially if you live in close to the border okay but right now um we've got people that are that like the USDA taking care of this we've had different eradication programs so right now it is not a cause for alarm it is a cause for people to be aware of what's happening and to pay attention that's correct. I mean, it, it, a, a producer really can't do a whole lot more now than just observe the animals and be aware of what the situation is and going on. So, I mean, they should keep updated with whatever APHIS is coming out with or the USDA is. But the, the government is on, on high alert with this deal, okay? Uh, and and they're, they're making a concerted effort to keep that, keep the, keep that screwworm fly down south and out of the United States. They, they don't want it just south. They want it in below Panama. Okay. On anything to do with parasite control, understand that it's management. Okay. And that's what this is going to be is a, is a management deal. Okay. You can have all the drugs in the world. You can have all the new wonder dust and all this other stuff. But <laughs> still, it comes down to animals and diseases and insects or parasites it all of it boils back down into management and using what we have properly you know isn't it funny how so many things it just comes down to just basic animal husbandry right i mean it really does i mean so much starts with just animal husbandry i mean that that that's it i mean if, if you could package and sell management in a bottle we'd all be rich <laughs> right exactly you got it doc Dr. Harold Newcomb, Technical Services Veterinarian with Merck Animal Health. Thank you so much for the time and really explaining 
the severity of New World Screw Worm and reminding all of us that so many of these issues that we face in the beef business can potentially be controlled with just basic management. 